My name's Labria. Um, I graduated in 2017. Um, I was an elementary and special education major, and I currently teach eighth grade English in North Carolina. My name is Selena, and I graduated in 2016. My major was dance, choreography track. I minored in entrepreneurial studies, and I currently teach dance at a African-American dance company, and I travel and I teach to propel schools. Hi everybody, my name is Indira Prins. I graduated in 2016. I was a double major in social work in Spanish, and currently I am a trans, just changed roles. So I was a youth advocate, but now I'm a transitions manager um, at an agency in Los Angeles. Okay, my name is Chuck. I graduated from SHU in 2017. I recently graduated from uh, IEP and the University of Taipei. Uh, so I spent eight months living in Taiwan. Uh, currently, I'm looking for a job. My name is Holly. I graduated in 2016. I was a psychology major, and now I'm working as a patient care specialist at a medical marijuana dispensary. Um, okay, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jeff, um, Jeffrey Bennett. I graduated from SHU in 2017. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's in criminal justice, and currently I work as a court representative at an agency in New York that does pretrial work. My name is Kate O'Neill. I am an academic program management at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. My job's really weird, but yeah, I run the pediatric critical care medicine program there, so that's what I do. What else did you guys say? 2015 is when I graduated. And what was your major? Uh, Spanish and communication. So I'm really utilizing both of those. Awesome. Thank you for all of those introductions. Um, just before we get into the questions, I uh, just want to preface the purpose of this meeting for everybody who will be watching. So it's important. Um, I think this was really sparked by conversations that I was having with Jeff on Instagram of just um, observing how silence can make you complicit in the violence that has been going on and just recounting our experiences uh, as to black american students at a prominent predominantly white institution um we shared a lot of similar experiences and i thought about how it's very easy to talk to your friends about what you experience but like we I don't think as, and people can disagree with me in this space in the coming conversation, but I don't think that we did a good job as a university community and holding space for these conversations and um, holding space for conversations between a, a diversified group of people. And I put diversified in quotes because y'all know what seeing him looks like. So diversified group of people. Um, so I, I want, this conversation to be as productive as possible. We are here to have real conversations, to establish uh, empathy, to ask real questions and have, you know, critical and meaningful dialogue around uh, safety and race relations um, that we experienced um, in undergrad and then also attempt to come up with plausible solutions um, that we can pose to university administrators. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the purpose of this conversation. So um, I will be facilitating the questions um, and I will be popping in my answers here and there, but I really uh, want this to be as interactive as possible. So um, if your guard is up or you have any anxiety just want to give you a moment to just breathe and let let it go and know that this is a safe space um and 
we are we're not bashing we're not here to have a disagreeing and fighting match this is just to have real honest conversation so the first question posed is or prompt rather when i think of my experience at shu three words that come to mind are anybody can feel free to answer that first initially i think the first word that always comes to mind for me is isolated um isolated yet the community that i built i felt a sense of togetherness um and i'll give you a phrase just kind of going with going with the flow i think for me probably growth joy and sadness i feel like it was a time of learning a lot about myself which was really painful but in the long term good for me and i also made some of the longest lasting friendships i have at seen hill so that's where a lot of the joy comes from is the aftermath of being there i would say the three words that describe my experience was stimulative just because like the class work and you know um sometimes just being around so much different people and getting to be able to learn so much different perspectives um odd because i feel like those are the times when i realized i guess me and my diversity and my differences like compared to the norm at Stephen hill but i'd also say like fun because i got to ex meet a lot of cool people got to meet a lot of cool faculty members that i kind of was able to you like kind of what endear said have it together this or you know i guess the uh, same feeling of like out of place with two i would say uh for me challenging like going to SHU really challenged my ideas that I was brought up with, that I was quote unquote brainwashed with, like being a white male in an all white community my whole life. Then going to SHU, like meeting a uh, diverse com uh, community, uh, creating my own community, so to speak. Okay, my friends really challenged my views on life and uh, then turned into a family which is my second word, because my sophomore year, as Holly know, knows, uh, we went to China. Uh, so really helped me uh, bring out um, good views for me and just mature. Mature is my third word. So going to Seaton Hill really matured me, made me the adult that I am today. Yeah, I think I would definitely echo what Holly said about growth. Um, I definitely had probably the most diverse group of friends in my life at Seton Hill, um, which I really loved. Um, I think that was probably the coolest part of going there was the people from all the different backgrounds and countries in some instances. Um, it was I don't know, it was really mind expanding. And I went to a small private school right outside of Pittsburgh. So I didn't really, I mean, I had friends outside of my race and culture before, but not to that um, degree. So it, there was a lot of growth, I would say. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to stick to that word because it covers a lot. So my three words are art because I really got to do my art um, in many different ways when I was at SHU, which I'm very grateful for. Um, opportunity, because I had a lot of opportunities artistically and in leadership roles with like the feminist club, the dance club, being an RA, um, also being able to choreograph like my own pieces. Um, I had a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, my last time I knew strength, because there was definitely a lot of hard times in college. Um, and I think I really found my voice in college about like, you know, issues that I, I was really passionate about and speaking out about. And um, for me, like my background, um, I was, when I was up, I lived in a like predominantly all black community. So I was the minority like growing up. 
So it was different for me because I never, like, I didn't really understand what was going on really because I was the minority growing up. So then when I went to school and I realized, oh, there are way more white people than black people in the world. Um, it kind of was just like an eye opener for me because growing up, that's not how it was. So coming to SHU really like opened my eyes and show me a different way of like how the world really worked, honestly, because I was just in a bubble from where I lived at. Um, so that was, you know, eye opening. Well, I think my three words, um, resilience. I didn't know how strong I was or how strong I needed to be on a daily basis until I spent four years on that campus. Um, my second word is fear. Um, it, and not even in, uh, I don't know, not, not even in an invasive of personal space sense of the word all the time, but like, is my hair too big today? Is my outfit too loud today? Um, you know, am I laughing too loudly in the hallway? Am I using too many colloquialisms in the presence of too many white people? Um, that Those are questions that were always on my mind. And um, inadequacy, I think. I, I remember my first day of classes freshman year, I was in a classroom uh, and I was one of maybe maybe three um, black students in the classroom and I heard about all their summer experiences and they were in Aspen for the summer and they had you know uh, equestrian at their high school and like it, it was just so different from my my experience in high school I felt like uh, or I remember thinking like why am I here or or how did I get here or am I going to be good enough to stay here um, so those are, those are my three words. Did everybody get an opportunity to share? Give me a, th just thumbs up for those. Ads. Thank you. Okay. So second question or prompt, my most memorable experience was. And this could be good or bad. Um, I guess I'll go first. So. I'd say my most memorable experience would have to be like just the environment issue, just like going to the Cove and seeing like all my friends that were there and getting to like, you know, hang out. Um, one definitive moment would be like my senior year. Like I feel like that was like my favorite year. Like I got to be able to start the Black Student Union with Labria, like got to be a treasurer. So I felt like I was a lot more involved in the process of how seeing Hill like work. Um, Viability, I don't know how long, I don't know if the club is still there, but that was just my favorite. I think that the most memorable thing for me would also be the clubs that I was in. I was in, uh, I was president of Feminist Collective, and I think that was probably where I formed a lot of how I think now, and I learned a lot more about how to speak with people by listening and not trying to overpower the conversation. So. I think that that experience really molded me the most. I think for me, it was being like an honorable member of MISO. I, didn't, I never really went to any of the meetings, but I, I loved Keisha and so, and I loved all the people that participated in MISO. It made me feel, they made me feel welcome. Um, and the other groups and clubs that I was a part of, um, like FGL and what else was I part of? I was the president of Phi Alpha, the Social Work Honor Society. So. I think those experiences kind of help keep me grounded for the most part. Um, I think just senior year was also a definitive moment just because I was like in grind mode and I was just kind of ready to be done with school, done with shoe, done with school, ready to like be an adult. Um, and so, yeah. Um, I'll go next. I think for me, it was definitely studying abroad in the Dominican Republic. Um, I think in the Spanish major, a lot of people studied abroad in Spain and that's fine. I'd been to Spain before and I actually remember getting a lot of 
plaque for going to the DR instead of Spain. Like, why would you want to go there? Like, it's a third world country, but I don't know. Honestly, it was the most humbling experience I'd ever had in my life. Um, I felt like even more connected to Hispanic culture. I mean, Spain's not Hispanic, but you know what I mean. Um, had going there and um, I just became so close with a group of students I would have never been close with had I not gone on that trip. It was just, it was really crazy. I mean, I guess that's the point of, not the whole point, but it was credits, but um, going on those trips as you become close with people you wouldn't really expect and make memories that you never thought you would have or have the opportunity to have and went with some incredible professors and students and met professors that were a part of that school. So that, that was probably my most memorable experience for sure. So I'm going to do two. So for like best and like worst, I guess, but the most memorable experience I had that I really remember that was positive was when I won the RA of the year award my junior year. Um, that was like a huge accomplishment for me. And I was really excited because I really worked my butt off junior year with bats in people's rooms and no hot water and everything that could have went wrong went wrong when I was RA that year. So, um, and then I think the like kind of negative most memorable thing that happened to me in Seton Hill was when I found out that I was going to have to have like emergency surgery my junior year also and like I wasn't allowed to dance I wasn't allowed to be in the show like I didn't know if I was going to even be able to finish college and that's when like I picked up the um business like business minor and I found like a new passion because I love that and I got more involved with clubs so it was kind of it was negative, but I'm. it was more positive in a sense, so. Uh, probably the most memorable, uh, probably going to China uh, for a three weeks living, or not living, but just staying there. The most eye-opening, uh, I've been thinking about this situation for a long time now, ever since uh, Michael Floyd was uh, murdered. So four years ago, and uh, you all know Western cultures too, right? You all had to take Western cultures. So we were talking about racial relations and uh, police brutality. And I didn't really understand, understand it. Um, and you all remember uh, how Trayvon Martin was uh, murdered six, seven years ago. Um, uh, I still feel ashamed because I didn't know all of the issues. I thought he did something wrong. Um, I never thought he should have been killed. Like when I was younger, I thought he should have been arrested. But growing up and like someone yelled at me in class and I just felt so ashamed because I knew that I offended them. So if that really helped me to look at the actual facts instead of listening to the, what the news wants me to believe. So if that was really eye-opening and I realized my mistake and to this day, I still feel ashamed. I wish I could go back in time and um, talk to that person and apologize. Thanks for sharing that, Chuck. I also am not sure if I heard you say Michael Floyd or not, but I just want to make sure um, that we are saying the name. So George Floyd, I believe that's that's. Oh, who you George are. Floyd. I apologize. No, you're you're fine. I just want to make sure we we saying the name. Um, I I think my most memorable experience at SHU was. Uh, spearheading the fashion show senior year um that was that was a dope experience for me um a stressful experience but it the the turnout was was amazing it was anything that I thought that 
the, or could have imagined or pictured how it was going to go with how the flow like it didn't it like paled in comparison to how it it turned out so I think that was my most memorable experience and it it gave me a weird sense of closure to having it be so close to um graduation it was just like okay like I feel like this is this is a moment that I can stamp to say like this experience was worth it um, in some form. So that was definitely my most memorable experience. Okay, so now that we have answered some surface questions, I want to get deeper into the conversation and Chuck began to preface uh, this conversation we're about to jump into. The next question is, how do you define racism? How I define racism is discriminating a person because of her skin color, because of her race. I had difficulty verbalizing what I define racism as, so I actually looked up some definitions and um, I found several, and the one that I found that was most fitting was the belief that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, or qualities especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. I chose that definition because I also think that a lot of racism, people think that they're not being racist when they're complimenting someone, complimenting someone in a way that is still racist. So like commenting on their belief, like, oh, you're black, so you must be athletic or something like that. Like some stereotype and thinking that it's a compliment. So I think that that's really common, especially in younger people. They think they're being cool and being cool with black people because they say things like that and it's the opposite of that. So that's why I chose that definition. I'll just, um, definitely I, I do just tie the word racism to just discrimination and treating people differently based on where they come from, what they look like. I mean, obviously it's race, it's racism, but um, I don't know. I think it's a lot more than people think it is. It's not always so blatant in your face. Like I have a Confederate flag and like I have a MAGA hat on or whatever, you know, it's like, it goes so much deeper than that. And like kind of like Holly said, like complimenting hair or like, you know, in the summertime, I just had a talk with this about another white friend about tanning and how problematic that is. I mean, a lot of white people aren't ready for that conversation, but I mean, it's definitely something that needs to be talked about. Like, don't go up to another black person and say, we're so like, you know, we're, I'm just as dark as you are. It's like, no, you're not like, and you get away with it for a trend and what what do black people have to do like you know it's like it's not trendy for black people it gets them killed in certain instances so i think there are a lot of levels to racism um and i, I think people get upset when you accuse them of doing something racist because they don't want to be I guess reflected as that type of person that does hold a Confederate flag and wears a MAGA hat. But it's like, we have to know that there's layers to this shit. It's deeper than just one definition and one thing. It goes, it goes really deep. Um, so I don't know. I'll stop there, I guess. <laughs> just like to piggyback off of what Kate and Holly said, I do also believe that racism is the belief that one's race um, or characteristic or physical characteristics is more deserving of opportunities or more superior compared to other ones, um, especially other minority communities. Um, but I'll take it a step further and kind of say that another form of racism is societal too, just the systematic um, setting up kind of barriers or obstacles for um, two people that are both human to kind of be able to seek or seize opportunity. Um, I think that's also a huge um, kind of chunk of what racism is and it's I feel like it's a lot of layers like what Kate said um, it's a lot of you know different layers of just um, kind of backing someone against the wall and kind of even 
harming their safety kind of too in a way. I definitely agree with what you guys have said. Definitely superiority versus inferiority. Um, I wrote down racism is any prejudice, discriminatory or discriminatory thoughts or actions against a person or persons based upon things that they're unable to change. Um, I know it's just racism that we're talking about as far as like race, but I also feel like it goes into like culture and religion. Um, and I don't want to say this incorrectly, not gender identity. Well, yeah, gender identity. So for me, for like my definition of racism, I definitely agree with what a lot of you guys said. Um, I think of it more as racism is definitely based on the fact of stereotypes and based on the experience of one person. So that might not make sense, but like I know that a lot of like racist white people that I've talked to and you know engaged with and just been like, why do you say this about people? They've said, well, you know, I had this interaction 20 years ago with this one person of that race. Okay, well, you can't generalize every single interaction you have with someone who looks like that person because of that one interaction. And for me, that's kind of where racism stems. It's for me, it's fear fear of something that's different and um just I definitely fear of differences um if something's different they're afraid of it I, automatically instead of just asking or talking about it or educating themselves stereotypes I think is a big thing with racism you have these stereotypes that people make up and then they think oh well that's really how people are and it's no that's why it's called stereotypes um and then I also think it is discrimination and the idea of superior and not giving that person the respect because you don't think that they are worthy of that because you see them lower than you because of what their culture religion race stuff like that so for me that kind of is what makes up racism um i i think i can find truth in like everybody's definition that has been presented i think i think that we're all saying very similar things, but it's almost hard to get down to the knit and grit of it. And I think that's because when we're talking about race or class or gender, like these things are socially constructed. Um, so it's, it's not, I, I don't, I don't want to say that, to go as far as to say like, oh, it's not real, but it's, it's a reality, but it's not real, if that makes sense. I, I think that um, we as humans benefit and get a lot of charge out of being able to compartmentalize and being able to say that this is a chair and I know it's a chair because it looks like this and I can go anywhere else in the world and know that this is a chair and I think uh you know similarly when it comes to uh defining people and having this separatism I guess um between how do I know that I am me and you are you? I think we put these labels on, on each other so that we can make more sense to our human brain to be like, okay, this is this because I can see these characteristics. And I, I believe that racism um, benefits from the system of being able to compartmentalize and using that compartmentalization to say, to bring harm and to to bring a lack of opportunities um or or barriers as as jeff was saying um and just keeping keeping the the ladder stagnant if you will um going going on with that point, um, based on your individual definitions and now like our collective definition or understanding of racism, have you seen racism perpetuated at SHU and how did you know what you were seeing? Um, I, at first I had to really reflect on this, um, but I think like the, the one thing that I really thought about was the fact that, and I don't know if you guys noticed this too, but it's like when you're going out, how there were certain houses that wouldn't allow black people in. 
And I mean, I personally didn't want to go to those parties because number one, I don't want to fuck with people like that. And number two, none of my friends are going to be there. So it was just kind of like, wow, I don't want to even be associated with those people at all. And I mean, not to name names, but uh, like the baseball house, I remember, and like the lacrosse house, that was always like so anti-black. And it was just like, I'm not going to, <laughs> to a party where my friends aren't allowed. It was just so absurd. Um, I think that was definitely a thing. And then also a personal friend, I remember, um, was having parties and they were off campus and it wasn't a big deal, but he was still getting tr in trouble with leadership at Seton Hill for throwing these parties. And it's like, why are you coming after a man of color or a black man, I'm not a man of color, but you know, it's like, because he's independently throwing fun events for um, people that go to Seton Hill, like who fucking cares? I don't know. So those are definitely the two biggest things that stand up um, in my mind. Of course, they revolve around partying, but <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was really disturbing. I would say that I have absolutely seen racism perpetuated at Seton Hill. I've seen it in almost every layer of campus life. Um, I've seen it I have many examples, but one that sticks out in my mind is um, a Black Lives Matter piece of artwork was placed in Morris Solarium, and I was an RA, and I was making my rounds, and I happened upon it, and somebody had graffitied over the original message, and um, I found that really upsetting, and I got a security guard, and the security guard said to me, well, we know what kind of kids did this. And I said, I don't know what you mean by that. And he said, well, black kids, obviously. And I was just so taken aback by the whole um, conversation. And I was also upset by the fact that he thought that because I was white, I would agree with him. And um, I, I said to him, obviously, that doesn't make any sense because obviously, but also this piece of artwork was a Black Lives Matter piece, so that really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And the most unfortunate thing for me is whenever I did try to take it higher up, because I didn't feel that that man should work at Seton Hill any longer. And whenever I had wrote my incident report, I had specifically used the verbiage and the wording that he had used. All I was told was that it would get looked into um, and nothing ever came of it. And I do know that Labria had also had meetings to try to get somewhere with this and nothing ever happened. So that's my most, that's actually one of my most memorable things from Seton Hill. But um, yeah, I would say it's definitely present there. Traditionally, I have been going last, but that sparked something for me. Um, that was definitely, um, or whenever I have these conversations with anyone, that's always like my first go-to example, not only because it was the most visible for me, but um, I don't know if anybody was friends with me on Facebook at the time, but when I had found it, we were just coming back from the DC trip and I was going to the vending machine when I found it that night. And I had took a picture of it and I posted it on social media and I had said my name and my major and my GPA and how disgusted I was and how I was praying for the person that did it, honestly, because I wanted them to have, have some sort of peace and healing, because um, I felt that that's what they needed. And <clears throat> it, was, it was interesting to me because I got an email from the president directly to meet with her in her office um, about the post that was made and the the conversation i just felt like my experience was gaslighted um to say well you know i have this experience in my household so i understand racism and this is not this is not an example of racism because they vandalize with peace signs um or it, 
whatever else was said. And I just remember feeling really defeated and unseen, I guess, because to me, it's like, it's like when unrelated related, it's like when we're talking about Breonna Taylor in the, in the, (laughs) on social media, and we're like, this is the most obvious case. This makes the most sense. Why aren't you doing anything about it? And to me, it was like, this is finally my gateway for you to see clearly the things that I have been experiencing every day. This was my gateway for you to address the white students on Yik Yak for saying we have guns in our room and we're going to kill all the black people on campus. This was my gateway for when I'm at the Cove getting my food for you not to call me Letitia or Libra or, or Liberty when my name is spelled. Like that, that seemed like the appropriate moment for me to say, okay, now, now's your opportunity to get it. Now I can talk about the other things. And it was like, it didn't, it didn't matter. Like all of the other microaggressions were still going to pale in comparison to this very large, very visible, very obvious example of racism. I would say that um, seen racism perpetuate at SHU, I would say I'd seen that at least on a bi-weekly, if not monthly time. And that's just me personally hearing it. I would say at least weekly or bi-weekly, definitely. Um, there's millions of times walking around campus or driving around campus, campus security looking at me very weird or them following me in their car. Or um, I remember one time when I worked at um, the Cove at Seam Hill, I remember all my, everyone at SHU was saying, oh yeah, they drop you off to the um, bus, the shuttle stops. I remember freshman year, they told my parents that, that they'll drop you off at the shuttle stop. I asked the campus police, because I lived off campus. I was like, can I get a ride to the YMCA? They were like, oh, we don't do that. And I was like, that's very strange. I just heard that you did that for one of my classmates like two nights ago. Um, we'd never done that. And I even took it up all the way up to the, um, to the president. because so I was like, or not the president, I think it was the dean of something, you know, and I got the same answer. We'll get back to you. Um, never heard from them. Um, but yeah, it's, it used to be everywhere um, from teachers telling me that they understand what's going on because they, they're they married to someone that's African-American or um, they have a lot of black friends. And I'm like, no, you don't understand my experiences and you know, you don't understand my frustrations, but at least you have to have a little bit of empathy towards them. Um, but yeah, very, I felt very minimized um, and felt like I, nothing I can do can kind of change anything. So I would say that, you know, I agree that I have seen that many times. I feel like it's, it's hard to answer this question because I have muted and tried to wash away all of the shit that I went through with you. Like literally when I graduated was when I was like, cool, I don't have to deal with any of the microaggressions that I've dealt with or the racism or the prejudiceness that black people deal with at this institution in this Western Pennsylvania area. Like I just, like hearing, hearing you guys' stories like brought up a lot of feelings for me and I'm, still, I'm starting to feel anxious. Um, and it's just, it's just really sad because the, I had I posted some stuff maybe like two weeks, three weeks, two weeks ago at this point. I saw that Jeff posted something. And I was like, you're right. Like I, I'm so far removed from seeing him. I didn't even I have I don't even follow them, but something told me, let me just look to see if I can find something that says that they they stand with us and they're going to support us as black people going through a, another pandemic on top of the COVID pandemic. Like and when I tell y'all I was scrolling through that Instagram page and I couldn't find a single indicator that said, hey, shoe students, not even shoe students of color, because I think that also we get bunched into that and people of color aren't necessarily dealing with the things that black people are dealing with. Um, and so it was it was like hidden in plain sight. Like I, re- I couldn't even find the post. And when I found the post, I read through it and I'm like, mm, 
this isn't really giving me comfort. It's not giving me support. It's not, it, it only screams I did what I had to do so that people wouldn't say that we didn't say something. Um, and whoever runs the Seton Hill page told me to go look at the full letter that the president wrote on the website. And that was a, that was a shit show looking for that too. Like, I'm like, where do I go? It's not, I, like I went through like maybe five different pages to get there. And once I read it, it wasn't much longer than what I read on Instagram. Um, and I still felt discomforted and like what I was feeling didn't matter. And then someone who maybe just, I guess he graduated this year, like reached out to me and was like, Seton Hill has always been this place of like inclusivity and diversity. And I'm like, my God, I went there for four years, four years ago. And I'm telling you my experience as a black woman, you're not even black to really even say what you're saying right now, because you have people of color that are your friends. That doesn't, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And I think that right there was just like a blatant response to like, y'all don't give a fuck. Y'all don't. And, it, and it's disheartening and it, it, it hurts because I spent four years here trying to grow and trying to mature and trying to feel connected. And every single year I wanted to transfer. Every single year I wanted to transfer because I did not feel like I belonged. Despite the friends I had, I, you probably couldn't tell because I walked down the hallways with a big old smile on my face because at the end of the day, I got to be good. I got to be good for me. So like when I moved off campus because I didn't feel comfortable, then living off campus, I still don't feel comfortable because I'm next to the ghetto Sunoco and there's just a lot of BS happening in Greensburg for black people. Um, and I don't think the, I don't think that the school really paid it really paid attention to what happened on campus unless it was specific to a black person doing something wrong. Otherwise, things like the baseball house or the lacrosse house, they can go on and continue to do the stuff that they would like to do at any given point in time. For racism, uh, yik yak for sure. I, I'm really bad with like dates and like names so please correct me if I'm wrong but I want to say it was in about it was around 2014 um I think Miso did the like candlelight vigil and I want to say it was for Tamir Rice around that time but I'm not sure I think it was in the winter but they did like a peaceful protest about police brutality and it was in the dining hall and I remember thinking oh my god that was beautiful that was great like you know it was awesome it was it was it was awesome I, I loved it um and then I remember going to Yik Yak and they were saying the most horrible things and I just remember thinking like how are these people even allowed to be on this campus why are there even people that are like this on this campus like this is so disgusting like the things that they were saying just horrible and I just remember that and I remember just being so angry and like so upset like why do people think that's okay to be like that like and that's when I think I really started seeing those microaggressions and those little things um definitely like um for me that was like an eye-opener of like what was really going on at SHU and I didn't really see it because I'm white and it never really happened to me unless it was another white person saying something that was like rude and um racially charged and I was correcting them but most people kind of knew not to say things like that to me because I have a big mouth and I'm very opinionated so um I didn't really have that interaction a lot um I do another one that I remember very vividly and I remember it was horrible. Um, I did a Saturday class and it was like a music class. And I remember I was sitting in the class and he was talking about like different music. And he was talking about like, um, like oriental music. And he was like, you know, when you go to like the China buff, like buffet in the corner and they play that music. And then he started like making this weird mimicking music of like, you know, oriental music and it was like super super racist 
And he said this in front of the class. Like, this was a staff member. He said this in front of the class. And I was just like, oh, like, I looked around. People are laughing. And I literally raised my hand. I was like, excuse me, that was racist. And he was like, oh, it was just a joke. I was like, no, it was racist. And then everyone's looking at me like, oh, she's just, like, this angry feminist, like, and I'm like, no, like, that was super, that's not okay, you can't say that. And then I remember he was talking about, like, how people would make, like, YouTube videos into music, and he was doing um, the one about how someone made a song that was, like, climbing in your window, snatching your people up, and I raised my hand, and I said, you know, do you ever think that there's a point where, you know, certain things are a little too far? I said, because to me, they're making fun of how he talks. Um, and at that point, he was in escalated state because, you know, his sister was, you know, almost sexually assaulted. And like, I, I don't find anything funny in that song. I, I don't. I said, I have a big issue with that being funny and being a song. And he was like, well, you know, we're not communist and blah, 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 blah. And if we do that, then put these restrictions, blah, blah. And I said, okay, well, I know we don't have these restrictions, but I'm saying there's a point where it's not funny. It's, you know, an issue. And I just remember being like, I don't want to ever go back to this class ever again and sit in it for four hours on a Saturday morning for this stupid credit. Like, and he was just so racist. And I was like, how how has no one said anything about this? And I remember I said something, they said, oh, we'll look into it. Nothing was done. So, and I, that was a big, I was like, I hated that class. I hated going there. I wrote my review at the end of the year, like, you're racist, your class was pointless. <laughs> like, I did, I ripped him a new one, basically. And I mean, I don't think, I don't know if he still works there, but um, it, it was, it was horrible. I hated that class. But those were two very distinct moments of racism that I saw. And for me, seeing it from a staff member was just, like, just appalling. Like, just, it was ridiculous, so. Um, before I get into it, I just want to uh, thank everyone for educating me. Um, because I'm... I never saw his acts as shoe, uh, to be honest, because I wasn't attuned to it. I wasn't aware of it. I mean, I, were, I was aware of situations, but I wasn't angry that, as angry as I am now, that these acts happened. These acts should have never have happened. Okay, now, I... I want to point out the curriculum at Seton Hill. I might be jumping the gun a bit. Um, in a way, you can say that uh, shoes, shoes classes are racist. Why, why do I have to take two Western cultures classes? Why do I have to learn about European culture my whole life? Then I get to Seton Hill, I have to take two um, Western cultures classes. I believe that Seton Hill should educate us more about Black culture in America as well as African culture. I mean, I, I would like that. I want to know the issues that we're facing in uh, the U.S. I wish I learned more about it when I was younger. So I could have spoken out about it and tried to help. Thank you for sharing. Uh, the next prompt we're going to go into is something that Indira began to touch on um, in regards to safety. So um, we are going to respond to the following statement. I felt safe on SHU's campus and or in the surrounding community. Um, before I lose my thought, I'm going to share my response to this prompt. Um, two situations distinctly stand out. Um, the first was my experience in my thinking and writing course, and everybody has to take that freshman 
year um, unless you came with your English credit or whatever. And I remember writing a paper and um, I had to discuss with the professor my paper and he was going to give me feedback, blah, blah, blah. And I got to the meeting and he said, I don't know where you came from or who told you that you were a good, you were probably a good writer, but what you're doing here doesn't fly in college. And I had a lot of back and forth with this professor, so much so to the point that I was on academic probation because for those who don't know, I had a full scholarship to go to SHU. So, and I couldn't afford college if I didn't have a scholarship. It was either I'm going to stay here and grind it out, or if my scholarship gets taken away, I'm going back to the hood and just figure something else out. And um, I, I bring that up in regards to safety because it challenged um, my efficacy, like my belief that I could that I could handle college. It challenged how safe I felt going to other professors to ask for help. Um, it made me feel unsafe to raise my hand in that like maybe I maybe I'm wrong or maybe I'm stupid or maybe I just don't get it and everybody else does. And it it didn't make me feel safe in everything that I thought that I knew about me in terms of my intelligence. Um, the second incident was I was driving. This this was maybe maybe junior year, might have been the end of sophomore year. I was driving. I don't know where I was coming from, but I was at that intersection where the, the YMCA is on the corner, and I'm about to make that left and to get back to campus. And it was a yellow light. Nobody was on the, the street. I took the yellow light it was turning red as I was making my left and I'm driving and I see a cop behind me and I I'm thinking in my head okay should I pull over now or I'm not thinking that I did anything wrong so I didn't want to look guilty I just a lot of things were circling in my head so I could continue to drive to campus which was another three to five minutes from where from where I was at that present moment. And as soon as I turned onto campus, that's when the police officer um, turned on his lights and he got out of the vehicle. I shut my vehicle off, turned my lights on, did all the, the right things. And he, he said that I, I ran a light by the courthouse and I'm, I'm in panic mode. So I'm not even thinking where the, courthouse was in relation to where the why was he asked me did do you know where the courthouse is I was like no and he said well you said you've been a student here for x amount of years how do you not know where the courthouse is do you are you sure that you go here mind you I had my student I my parking sticker right on my my mirror um I you know I I didn't think <laughs> I, I needed any more proof. He's, he asked me maybe three more times if I'm sure that I'm a student, walks away from my car and then comes back and says, are you carrying any drugs? And I'm, I'm, I'm like shaken. At this point, campus police comes driving down the hill. They stop, ask the officer, is everything okay? And he was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm handling it. And the campus police kept on driving, didn't address me, didn't ask if I was okay, didn't, like, wasn't even a person that said, like, oh, I can validate if this person is a student, or it's just even stay there to make sure that, you know, I was okay as, like, this was happening on campus, technically. Um, and when I talked to one of my professors about it, um because I was torn up they were like well that's just protocol you know in Pennsylvania they they walk away from the car and they're liable to ask you any other questions that they have because they closed the case of 
you running the light and now they had another question to ask you so it was fine and I again like echoing these feelings of being unseen or unheard or misunderstood um I didn't um have anybody there in terms of faculty or administration that was able to validate my experience like no this is wrong there was no problem probable cause for anybody to ask you if you had drugs in 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 your your vehicle this was you know 10 11 o'clock at night i'm having so many thoughts go in my head about where my fate can be in the next five minutes and it was that that going back on onto campus feeling like nobody else has to think about that when they're pulled over um always just made me feel super unsafe i would say the answer to that question or like how i'd respond to that question is um i definitely felt like there was my safe spaces on campus whether it was the miso office with keisha or when i worked at the cove like being there or you know wherever i was with my friends kind of but for the most part i don't feel like it was a safe place um i feel like where growing up in the hood um labria knows like mount vernon the bronx um it's very diverse area so i met oh i never felt like i was out of place or a fish out of water but greensburg was definitely the place where i learned like no you're black and you're you're less than the rest of us um I had, uh, whenever I was driving, I think from work, that's when I worked at Starbucks, um, there was someone cut me off and I cut them back off. Probably shouldn't have done it. Um, and then they proceeded to wind down the window and call me the N-word. So, I mean, there, it's just, it was blatant whenever I was off campus. If I was on campus, of course, those moments of microaggression and um, just pure racism did occur too. So. Um, I always walked over, walked around with like a, you know, looking over my shoulder, like, you know, whenever somebody would say, let's go do this, um, or let's go do that, let's walk here, I'd be like, no, I'm just going to leave, you know, I'd rather be off campus in my own sanctuary than actually doing things on campus, like going to the library, like, um, I made sure I got my car, because I was like, I'm not walking through these streets late at night. Um, so, I mean, I made sure that I made myself safe, but for the most part, no, didn't feel safe at all. My first year, um, they definitely told me that campus police would be able to take me to the shuttle stops if need be. Um, and I pressed my mom about getting a car because I was like, mom, like, I don't want to be the only person on campus without a car. She's like, no, there's a shuttle. You'll be fine. I never got a ride by campus police. Not the snow, not the sleet, not rain. Didn't, didn't matter. That's not what they were on campus for. And hearing your story, LeBray, I'm not really sure what they were on campus for now that I know that. Um, I think that was like my first sign of like, you really need to get your own space. If you're going to stay at this school, you need to find something that makes you feel safe. And that was getting an apartment with my uh, roommate, aka best friend. Um, and I think having that space away from campus and being away from everybody else helped me reflect on like everything else that I needed to get done to graduate, to be done um, with school. Um, I can't really count all the microaggressions. I can't really, like I said, I think I've, I've just really blocked everything out and it's probably not the healthiest thing to do. That's something I'm going to have to discuss with a professional, but I, I really, I'm, I'm hearing, the, I'm hearing the stories and I'm, it's like, I'm shocked, but I'm also not shocked. And that's the sad part about it. I'm going to keep my answer really short to this. I did not feel safe at Seton Hill, but that had nothing to do with the color of my skin. So, um, I felt safe for the most part on campus, but downtown I did not feel safe. I was actually followed a few times by um, males and I had to like run. So um, on campus I felt safe. Um, off campus I did not, but it wasn't because of the color of my skin. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I feel like an asshole, but yeah, no, I, I definitely felt safe on, on campus. Um, I wasn't really off campus a lot. Um, but yeah, there are townies. They're a little scary. 
um, but definitely never felt unsafe to the point where I would even say I felt slightly unsafe. And I know that's my privilege, but you know, just to answer the question. Okay. Um, so I felt safe uh, on campus for the most part. Um, I worked with the athletic department. I, I was a sports management major. So my thoughts about campus police, uh, I, I don't respect them a lot. Um, no disrespect to them, but I, I hardly have respect with them because they didn't do, um, now knowing, um, they didn't do their jobs um, to the community by keeping everyone safe. Um, and it just makes a lot more sense. Um, I think they're incompetent. Um, I don't think they know how to uh, keep people safe for the most part. Now the community, I grew up around uh, Greensburg uh, counties or uh, counties or counties. They talk a lot. They want to start fights with you, um, and, and I can I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. Um, uh, it's just tough um, to talk about because hearing these stories, I, I just feel so bad, and I wish I could help. I wish I could help more. Thank you for everybody that has shared. Um, and this, we have two more points and then we're going to wrap up. But I just want to open the floor now to any of us who have questions for the group or questions directly for another person based on what they have, have shared. Um, so if if anything came to your mind when listening to somebody else's experience or you want to ask a, like I said, a general question to the group that has not been asked yet, I want to give the space for those questions now. And if there's no questions, then we'll move forward. I have a question. So I post stuff about Black Lives Matter um, every week on Facebook, but I feel like I'm not doing enough. How, how can I help? How can I help the community? How, how can I help everyone? Because I see my own Americans being killed, like on TV, on, in the news, like the cops uh, don't have any respect. Like they're unjustly killing people. And I wanna know what I can do. What part can I have? I know if that's a loaded question, but. I, I think it's important to, um, one, like put words to your privilege, like recognize it, acknowledge it, um, and also put words to the reality of the situation. Like the cops are not killing people. Like cops are disproportionately killing black people because they are being posed as a threat. Um, and, and killing Black people who are unarmed, killing Black children who, uh, are, like, not neurotypical. Um, so that I think it's, it's necessary to call a spade a spade in these moments so that you can tackle the issues. You can't, you can't tackle an issue that you are not acknowledging. Um, Two, I think that um, it's very easy, especially with social media, to make issues of social justice performative. So it's very easy for us to post things. And there's nothing wrong with, with posting. There's nothing wrong with having Black Lives Matter in your bio. There's nothing wrong with um, posting things to keep your followers informed and your community informed. There's nothing wrong with that. However, um, there needs to be a question of, 
or, or a paradigm shift of like, I know that I'm non-racist, but how am I going to actively be anti-racist? And what does that look like? How am I going to um, have these tough conversations with my family members that don't, don't agree with me? I don't think always the change is like, I need to be outside and I need to be marching. Some people are immune compromised and we can't, can't march. Some of us have families that we have a large responsibility to and we can't go out and protest, but we can sign a, a, a petition. We can um, keep ourselves educated and informed. We can read books. We can attend uh, uh, these, these resources have been coming up where people are having anti-racism workshops. We can attend those free of charge. We can listen to podcasts. We can just make sure that our circle of friends and people that we interact with are diverse and we're listening, actively listening to their perspectives um, and, and validating their perspectives as well. It's one thing to just say like, oh, I'm hearing you. Like, I know that's happening, but like asking people who are going through the plight as well. Um, and this is not just, you know, black people. This is all like an intersectional experience. Yes, this in directly involves people who are uh, Black or Indigenous, um, people in the LGBTQ plus community, uh, people who are experiencing homeless. Like when we say like homelessness, like when we say Black Lives Matter, we have to mean all Black Lives Matter. And if we are saying all Black Lives Matter, then we need to position, like, position ourselves so that we can be in touch in some way with with the all. I hope that made sense. And, and I'll definitely be more specific when I say that. And I apologize if I offended you or anyone. I'll, I'll call a spade a spade for sure. Thank you, thank you. I was gonna say also, I mean, I think putting your money where your mouth is is a great way to, um, you know, actively show you care. I mean, I think there is something to be said for being performative online. And like Lavria said, it's not so much about like, you know, posting informative things on your story that, um, you know, educate people. Um, yeah, definitely having those conversations with your other white friends, not being afraid. Um, I think that's something I, oh, it's been a while since I felt that way, but, you know, I had felt that way at a certain point in my life. Like, I'm not going to stand up to my aunt and say, you know, what you just said is fucking racist. Like, now I'll say it, but, you know, it's like that takes time and courage to do, and it's like that's being an ally, and, and also, yeah, it's like if you can't get out there and march, I mean, sign the petitions, have the conversations, put your money where your mouth is, research these um, organizations that you can donate to that help black people, help Black Lives Matter. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's how I've been working as an ally. I mean, if anyone has any feedback for how I can do more, I'm always willing, um, but that's my personal take. I do wanna say as an ally, it's been um, helpful for me to have these conversations and um, definitely it's been helpful to see all the resources po po excuse me, popping up on social media. It's definitely been very helpful for me to know where to look and where to research. But I also think it's important to say um, that's also not Black people's job to teach us about how to do better and how to be better. It's our job to figure that out. And that does mean listening and um, trying to be a better ally through these conversations, but I think it's also important to not, that's a lot of pressure for someone to constantly be asking them, how can I be better? Um, how can I be a better ally? So I know that would definitely be too much for me. So I can imagine that would be too much for the black people in my life. Um, I know for me, just like, I always make sure that if I do hear something that is racist, that I say something because to me, um, being silent is basically saying like you agree with that and I've always believed that ever since like I was in high school and like ever since I was younger like if you don't say something you get roped into oh well they think it's okay because they didn't say anything and that can you know be very challenging I know most of the interactions I have with that or with my family 
Um, most of my family are Trump supporters and um, say very racially charged things. And I have to check them real fast. And um, that's really hard, especially when it's your family that, you know, you care about, but also it's like, uh, that's not okay. So I think just being, a, don't be silent. That's probably the biggest thing that I've been really trying to do is always like, you know, just say something because sometimes some, they might think that, I mean, cause sometimes it is ignorance. Like someone says something and they have no idea that what they said is like so messed up. So by you just saying, Hey, that's not okay. That might change and they might never say that again. So like, I know in my head, I think, oh, well, maybe if I say something, that could be changing them, and that could make a positive change, so that's just what I think. I might not really have been doing anything, but that's what I like to think. <laughs> any other responses to Chuck's question or any other questions to be posed before we move forward? If I can just add one thing, because I think it's interesting. Um, so my friend from Taiwan, she came uh, here back in January. She's studying at IEP right now. So she's been asking me all of what, what's going on, why are these issues going on? I, you know, I, I want to say something, but I don't know how to educate someone about racism in America. I just gave her the baseline. But I, I don't know how to continue to educate someone who, who didn't grow up in America. How, how do you guys uh, recommend me doing that, educating people? Sorry for asking two questions clarifying question for you and then I have an answer um okay what's the baseline to you baseline I mean if we're going to the absolute beginning I believe that you know colonists from Europe uh came to the Americas and just absolutely murdered natives um indigenous people, sorry, and just took the land from them. Then they created society, societies, uh, countries for only one race. And, you know, they forced Africans to become slaves. Then the government gave them the freedom through the Civil War and talking about America now. Then, but racism continues to this day. Even though people are free, there's still oppression through our laws. I guess that's my baseline. Okay. Um, thank you for answering that. Um, I am, and I, I am saying this firmly and with love. I'm going to echo something that Holly said before I, before I do that. The, something that I tell my students all of the time is that I know that you have mastered the material when you can teach it back to me. Now, when we're talking about race and, and these complexities, there's, there's no mastering the material, right? Like there, there's always going to be um, something else to learn and something else to take away from. I think though um, that you just always have to be in the position of a student and ready to learn. Like there's, there's not going to be a moment that you're like, I have become the master and the, the knower of all knowledge when it comes to race relations and racism in this country. It's just not going to happen. And it's not because you are a white man. It's, it's, it's for, for all of us. All of our experiences are going to keep happening until they, they stop. Um, so keep educating yourself. Keep reading. Keep asking critical questions and encourage other people to do the same. Like don't, it, it's, it's like Kali was saying, it becomes exhausting trying to come up 
with solutions of that's just like for example if I ask you how are you and you say oh well I'm having a bad day today and I just say okay well if you need me I'm here like that's that like that's that's great like intention but I'm not helping you. Uh, like I like and I'm not and I'm when I ask you then well what do you need what do you want me to do or like what do you need from me sometimes in the moment if I'm having a bad day I don't I might not know what I need in this moment I might know how not know how you can help and I think when it comes to a topic of asking like the black and indigenous people what can we do to help it's like I don't really know what I need right now outside of I want to be seen and I want to feel loved and I want to feel safe um and I don't know how to make that happen and I don't know how to tell you how to make that happen so um that's not to say like this is just a hopeless attempt but it's it just just keep keep doing the work where however the work takes shape for you and encourage other people to do the same and if anybody has anything to add to that you may Add on a little bit. I think just the overview is kind of just education is so important, like reading books. Um, there's a lot of, if you Google, there's a lot of like resources that can teach you how to be a better, how not to be a better ally, because I feel like we all can be better in our own way, but kind of just the foundation of like, this is what you should tell people to do. Um, this is the information and overview kind of like what's going on and the systematic oppression that's happening in America. Um, and I feel like when you do that, I, it's, it is exhaustive to kind of continue to um, inform other people like this is what you need to do. But it's easy to kind of tell someone, hey, this is this book I read. Um, it's a great topic. I can send you the link. Something as simple as that can really open someone else's horizon and mindset of like this is what's going on. So I just think education is kind of like a good, I guess, overviewing um, help or tool to kind of get knowledgeable like about the topic. And I think to kind of go back to your main question of like, how can you help that person? Have them study with you. Like as you guys are going, as you're going through your own educational process, invite that person to do it with you so you guys can bounce ideas off of each other or bounce, have critical critical thinking conversations um, from the material that you're, that you're reading. Like everyone's saying, like yes, it, it's very exhausting. Like, and I, I have to do my own research as well. Even being a black person, there's so much more that I have to learn, um, and it's hard to it's hard for me to do that and teach other people. So, if you are doing that along alongside someone who doesn't know as much, then I think that may be successful. We apologize for if I offended or exhausted anyone. I, for me, I just want to continue to educate myself as well and uh, continue to learn from others. That's, that's definitely respected. And I, I speak for myself and I believe like I speak for other people here. Like we, I, I appreciate you asking the question. Um, I think just to clarify when we're talking about exhaustion, like like it's just like if if i run around in the circle once like i'm i might not be that adjust uh, exhausted if i run a mile in a circle that i might like get more exhausted so like that that's just to say when it's constant and happening often that's when the exhaustion takes place not just for you like answering a qual a, a clarifying question so i don't want you to feel like burdensome or anything like that um and your question is definitely appreciated. Um, I, I want to respect everybody's time and go to this last statement. I'm going to tweak it a bit just so that we can condense the time um, because I think this last question is the largest question um, and a question that we're probably not going to reach a solution to yet. Um, but just to start the conversation around what changes need to be made in order for SHU to be a safe, equitable, and anti-racist environment. Um, I'm going to give everybody think time because I want, if you can condense your answer to, um, 
two to three sentences of like I believe she needs to dot 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 um that would be beautiful um and also understanding that we can still as this core group still have conversations around this and still talk about solutions and stuff but this the purpose of this video is really like an introductory moment to get the conversation started um not just keep it going in here but like for it to start conversations with other um alumni and other people who currently go to shoe people who go to surrounding universities or just go to um pwis in general um so just a moment of think time what changes need to be made in order for shu to be a safe equitable and anti-racist environment i think the first thing we've determined is that people need to be held accountable for their actions at seton hill um i think something that we all have in common is that um people have not been held accountable and that's where we've seen a lot of the racism and where um you know, Labrie, you were saying you're feeling unsafe. I think that that could have been solved by, um, or not solved, but helped by um, that person being held accountable for what they were saying and feeling supported. Um, I think that they need more education, um, especially when you are a freshman, sophomore, because you're younger and that's used when people more immature and say things like pretty off the wall. Um, but um, education definitely all the way through the four years, but I think definitely when you first come, they need a lot of that education because people are coming from different backgrounds. Um, I think listening and then accountability. Definitely to piggyback on both of um, what you guys said, there just needs to be a forum for listening and taking these things seriously. Um, I think that's the most important thing and action on the things that are being communicated. Um, also, yeah, there, there does need, I mean, I know it sounds kind of lame to say like a diversity training, but like there needs to be a diversity training. And I do recall after I left, there was some type of attack on like the British boys house and people were telling them to go back to their country and right then and there, there was a whole thing held with all of the different sports teams. They had to take a diversity training. I mean, this is from what I was told. I was graduated. But it's like if they can do that for, you know, a bunch of white guys from England, they can, um, they can, they can do it for other issues that are larger and um, more impactful, I guess I would say. Um, so, yeah. Um. So I wrote a little sentence um, when Labria said two to three sentences. Um, so I feel that Shu just needs to develop, like to kind of be able to be more inclusive and um, safe and equitable, like recent Labria said, um, with kind of just how they handle situations. I just feel like they need to develop true routes of inclusivity, acceptance, and protection for other diverse members of the university. Um, there should be no reason why if the color of my skin is different or if my gender um so happens to be um female or non-conforming or transgender why i can't feel safe on this campus um or i can't feel safe from ridicule um that just speaks testaments and i feel like i don't want to i kind of want to make a little statement like just about um it's not just racism it's definitely a lot of different other things um i noticed everyone here was saying kind of um that they didn't feel safe and you know that you guys are women of color and you still feel safe i mean i'm sorry women who are white and you guys still feel safe just because of the fact of your gender and that shouldn't be right um and another thing i think is just there needs to be more funding and exposure for diverse clubs and departments with active participation from upper management um i feel like i'm not sure labria if we worked on one or two fashion shows those alone um maybe miso events where did where was um Mary Finger? And I'm name dropping. Where was Mary Finger? Where was um anyone that wasn't part of MISO um in upper management? I'd never seen them at I maybe I've seen them at one or two, or maybe if it's during the day, but for the most part, never seen them actively participating there. Um and a third sentence and kind of to close it off is just um there needs to be an actual effort for changing the process of how situations are handled internally, um, as well as outside of SHU. I think that one statement from Mary Finger and that one letter 
is not enough. Um, why wasn't there a post about um, George Floyd? Why wasn't there a post about Breonna Taylor? Why wasn't there a petition even up? I think it's just because they don't want to kind of anger the community of not only individuals in Greensburg and funders, but also I feel like they don't want to um, shake the table and with the student body as well too, or with faculty, you know, it's a bigger problem that they have a lot of obstacles and I wish them well. I'm not gonna be the person helping them because I don't wanna put myself through that situation again and that, you know, mental trauma, but um, they definitely need to fix it on their own. I think that um, she really needs to be held accountable um, for following through. Just hearing that so many people have made complaints, I've even made complaints in my time at SHU, and nothing really come of it. Um, it definitely makes you feel unseen, unheard, uncared for, um, and can add to that the feelings of like unsafety or not not feeling safe. Um, I also think that there needs to be maybe some sort of like an equity team, um, maybe with some outside resources, so that the people who are change change is hard, change is difficult, and I understand that Seton Hill has been around for many of years and have have had the same traditions and the same kind of policies and practices um, but the further along we get in society the more change that we're creating as a people and I think that you guys need to to come up with the times as well um, I think that maybe like a diversity equity and inclusion class should be mandated um, I think that there needs to be more faculty that are involved in our in our clubs and groups um and it should like when i was at school it was just like miss marilyn fox elise came there was um keisha and i felt like those were the only people of color um that i felt comfortable being around that i felt comfortable being a part of their group um and I think that there just needs to be more like allyship to know like there are other faculty members that are on on board with diversity and equity and inclusion. We all know that Seton Hill is a uh, Catholic university and they preach to us um, Catholic social teaching. One of the principles is culture, family, community, and participation. Why, why hasn't Shu done that? Or if they don't practice what they preach, I, I don't know why. Now, I think Seton Hill needs to get better security guards. I think that Seton Hill's curriculum um, needs to become better um, because, because I'll say again, I sound like a broken record. We take two Western cultures classes. We're crying out loud, why? Why do I need to be taught European history again and again? It's not interesting to me. It doesn't further my own education. So I think that there is room uh, for improvement for Shu, and if this video will uh, help them. I just for for me um i think that the mission statement needs to be revisited um reevaluated and uh edited <laughs> and i i i think that um you know educating students to think and act critically um creatively and ethically um already paints the picture of not not what a, a seton hill alumni looks like but it's what does the palatable human look like what does the respectable human look like and i don't think um the mission statement in and of itself is uh inclusive at all um and i i would call for um Yes, echoing the diversity training, but um, diversifying the staff and the professors. I had not one professor uh, 
that was black um, or non-white. Um, and especially me being an education major <laughs> um, and being the only black student in my graduating class in that major, um, you can imagine my desire to teach in Title I schools and to teach in schools like the schools that I grew up in, um, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, I, I um, wasn't prepared to service Black and Brown students um, just from my experience in undergrad. Um, so I think that um, echoing what Chuck said as well, like diversifying the curriculum um, and and being as inclusive as we possibly can because an inclusive curriculum is reflecting what the students look like, not what Elizabeth Ann Seton looks like or believed or orchestrated her life on. Um, not saying that she is not important to the university or their their values, but you have to start questioning if you are going to be this this epicenter of 21st century learning and a 21st century experience, we cannot continue to push a mission statement that's reflective of a woman's values that lived this many years ago and had this this type of life experience. So um, I want to thank everybody again for your vulnerability, for your patience, for your willingness to have this conversation. Um, if I, I had a lot of anxiety going into this conversation, not that I like don't know all of you because I do, um, but you, I, I haven't had this conversation with everybody who's here. So I had no clue what to, what to expect. Um, and I just want to thank you for being gracious and for um, showing and having empathy and making this a fruitful conversation that I feel peace about um, moving forward. And this is not the only conversation that I hope that we have. Um, I hope that this does spark something. I hope that this does carry to administration and beyond that like i i hope i hope that this really um is a, a catalyst for for something major um any final thoughts from anybody one sentence before we close if you have final thoughts i just want to say thank you to you for putting this all together i know there's a lot on your plate to do all this and I know there's probably a lot of anxiety around this conversation, but I just want to thank you for being proactive and setting this all up um, so that we can also be proactive and, you know, spark this change. I just want to echo that. Thank you again, Labria. And um, also, I'm so happy to have seen so many of your faces again and had a good conversation. So I just wanted to say that too. Yeah, same here. It was really cool. I haven't seen you guys in forever. <laughs> this is a nice reunion. Um, but to talk about really important things. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for in opening up this discussion to be had. And I feel really lucky to be a part of it. So thank you. I don't know how this all happened because it kind of happened at the blink of an eye. One day I woke up and I was like, oh shoot, like this is what's happening at SHU. Um, and I think it really speaks to like the hazard yet forward piece that they're always speaking about. Like, yes, these are uncharted waters. Yes, these are uncomfortable conversations, but we have to keep moving. We have to move forward. We have to be inclusive. I just want to thank Labria again uh, for putting everything together. I also want to thank each and every individual here for educating me on what's going on at SHU, not only at SHU, but in our country, in our society. So thank you all again. I appreciate it. My face is really red right now because I'm a bit anxious in a bad and good way. Uh, overall, I'm really, really happy that we have this conversation. If there's nothing else to say, the teacher in me is telling everybody to put a thumbs up. So I know that I could close out this meeting. Uh, awesome, wonderful thumbs. Up.
Um, it was so wonderful seeing your faces. I, it's been like years. So I, I'm, I'm so happy to see all of you.